Well, we're doing our Christmas reading this year from an unusual place in Scripture. It's the book of Revelation. You might not think that the story of Jesus' birth is in the book of Revelation, but it is. And so I invite you to open your Bible and join me in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation is a fairly easy book to find in the Bible. It's the last one. So just go to the end, and uh, unless you've got a real big concordance back there, it's pretty easy to find. Chapter 12, and we're in verses, um, we'll start in verse 10 today, and God willing, uh, go through verse 17. Get your bulletin out, we'll write a couple of things down as we go along uh, today. Here's what it says in verse 10. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of the brothers has been thrown out the one who accused them before our God day and night they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they did not love their life even to the point of death in other words they were willing to die for what they believed in, and what they believed in was the, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, the book of Revelation is, is a fascinating book. It's, it's different in many ways from the rest of the Bible. What this book does is it throws back the curtain on eternity, and it enables us who cannot see with our natural eyes many of the spiritual and supernatural realities it enables us to see those, or at least to get some images and some thoughts and some ideas about these eternal realities that are going on. Jesus gave this vision to John the Apostle while he was on the Isle of Patmos. It's all one vision. It's revelation, not revelations. And it tells one story. It tells the story of the spiritual realities that in many ways affect and direct our daily lives in affect and direct the course of history and have from the very beginning and will to the very end. In this chapter, Revelation chapter 12, symbols are used to speak about a great struggle between God and Satan. One of the symbols is a woman who gives birth to a child. The woman symbolizes the people of God, his chosen people, and the child symbolizes Jesus, his promised Messiah and Savior. But there's another symbol in this chapter too, uh, and, and it's a dragon. Uh, that seems like a strange thing to read about in the Bible, but even in the Old Testament, those leaders and nations who tried to destroy God's people were often symbolized by Leviathan, by dragons, by these huge scary beasts uh, that would come and try to destroy what God was doing through his people. So we have the woman... We have the dragon, we have God's people and Satan, and we have this child, uh, Jesus, who was born to be the Savior. Earlier in this chapter, it says that the woman gave birth to a son, to a child, who is about to rule the nations with an iron rod, and he was snatched up to God and to his throne. That's the whole gospel story right there in one sentence from heaven's perspective a cosmic perspective, and, and it skips over the death of Jesus. It's the birth of Jesus, and then the ascension and the rule of Jesus. And so we wonder about the death. Well, where is that? Well, it pops up here in verse 11. Notice it says, the Lamb of God. They uh, overcame the enemy, Satan, the accuser of the brothers, by the blood of the Lamb. That's Jesus' death on the cross at Calvary and by the word of their testimony. They had to put their faith in that blood. The blood just didn't automatically save everyone. It's only those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is where we left off last week, and we didn't fill in the last sentence on our bulletin last week, so it's become the first sentence this week. Here it is. Let's, put, let's fill it in. Jesus' birth, Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection offers us eternal victory. Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection offers us eternal victory. It doesn't, it doesn't guarantee everyone eternal victory. Only those who have that testimony, that faith in Jesus. Now, if you, uh, you may have noticed there's bad English in that verse. Okay, uh, And Karen was quick to point that out to me uh, earlier in the week, uh, that uh, it's a, uh, a plural subject and a singular verb. 
but it's, it may be bad English, but it's good theology. It's good theology because in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, everything that Jesus did from the time that he was born until the time that he rules is considered to be a singular event. It's called by theologians sometimes the Christ event. And it all comes together into this one powerful move of God in history through Jesus Christ. It's not separate events in God from a heavenly perspective. It, it is, it's one event. Interestingly enough, in the Greek of the book of Revelation, there are some grammatical inconsistencies. And so it actually is in keeping with the book that we're reading that we would use a sort of grammatical inconsistency to express a theological truth this morning because John writes in a way that defies grammar and yet it reveals things that are heavenly and cosmic in scope. But let's move on uh, to the next verse. Verse 13, the voice in heaven is still speaking, and it says, Rejoice, O heavens, and all who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is very angry, because he knows that his time is short. So the battle continues, even though Jesus has been born, Jesus is at the right hand of God and has the victory, that victory is assured, there's still this working out in history of the victory. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's an assured victory, but it's not uh, a consummated victory. It reminds me, always when I think about this, of being a boy and playing sports out on the street. We had a certain group of kids that played together. We played football. We played baseball. Those were basically the two games that we played the most of. And we played together so much that once the teams were chosen, we already knew who was going to win the game pretty much every time. As soon as you saw who was on each team, uh, if you were on the winning team, you were feeling pretty good about playing the game that day because you knew that you were going to be on the winning side. If you ended up on the losing side, well, you, you just had to go out there and, and pull your boots up and, and, and be the loser, you know. Uh, that, that's all there was to it. And, and the same thing is, is true now. The battle isn't over. The game isn't finished. The final whistle, whistle hasn't blown. But we can tell by who the players are who the victor is going to be. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that this book is written in the first place to first century Christians who were being persecuted is to say, hey, I know the battle is still being uh, raged around you, but remember, you're on the winning team. We need to remember that as well. You know, I need to stop here and point out that in our Western culture, a lot of this stuff has been pushed aside by skeptics. Uh, well, are there really angels and demons and a throne in heaven somewhere and all of this stuff going? Isn't that just a, uh, a sort of a religious mythology to try to express uh, truths that are a little bit different from, uh, from scientific truth? Uh, and the answer to all of that is absolutely not. You know, we've been misled in some ways uh, by our vision of the world in the West. We need to, we need to recognize that Darwin and his theories have failed to explain the richness of the human experience uh, in the reality where we live. Uh, they have failed and they continue to fail. And more and more people are noticing that, even scientists, even scientists in the so-called uh, consensus. But that's a great discussion for another time. Today we just need to remember, though, that skepticism is not inevitable. We should believe in these truths that are being revealed because they explain the things that physical science cannot explain about our existence. And those things loom really large. In fact, they are what make us who we are, these invisible realities. And here we have God himself throwing back the curtain and saying, let me give you some information about why you think the way that you do. Let me give you some information about why you really think that there is such a thing as right and wrong and why you really think that certain things are bad and certain things are good and why you have this desire to live and not to die and why you turn away from some things and toward other things. There are answers to those things 
Uh, and those answers are not given to us by physical science, but they're given to us by revelation that God has uh, provided for us. Part of it is right here in front of us. Okay, so let's move on. Verse 13 says that the dragon, uh, when he saw that he had been thrown down to earth, uh, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the boy. Some of your uh, translations say that he persecuted the woman. In fact, the ones I looked at were kind of 50-50. Uh, a lot of them said pursued, a lot of them said persecuted. The reason for that is because the word dioko means both. It means to pursue and it means to persecute. And really, both are true here. Uh, one thing that's happening in history is that this invisible enemy of God, the dragon, the devil, Satan, the one who leads the world astray, hates God's people. He hates God. He hates what God is finishing in his people. He hates the fact that Jesus was born and he couldn't destroy him. Uh, they thought he destroyed Jesus at the cross, but now Jesus is elevated and he's king of kings and lord of lords. And, and he keeps losing. He lost when he tried to defeat God. He lost when he tried to destroy Jesus. And now he's going to lose when he tries to destroy God's people. It's just one loss after another, but he is intransigent. The hatred is just in every fiber of his being. He can't help himself almost, it seems like, at this point. He wants to destroy uh, God's people. And so the battle rages on. Uh, victory is assured. And he knows that. Notice it says here, he knows that his time is short. The implication is that Satan himself knows that he's going to lose the battle, and yet he insists on fighting it out to the bitter end uh, anyway. Now, I, I want you to notice here that the woman is described now in this verse as the one who gave birth to the boy, the one who brought Jesus into the world. The, this is a short chapter. There are only 17 verses in it, but five times the word for uh, to give birth, ticto in the uh, Greek, is in there. Five times in 17 verses, the birth of Jesus is mentioned. That's why we're reading this chapter at Christmas time, because the birth of Jesus is an important part of what God is doing. You know, it's interesting to look at our pop culture. We have these, inter these different ideas about Christmas. One that's taking hold is just sort of this Christmas is an appeal to our better nature. The world thinks that in our hearts we're really good. Just give us enough time and we'll solve racism, we'll solve poverty, uh, everybody will have enough to eat, uh, uh, all the wealth will be spread around, we'll get rid of disease, we'll get rid of war. Never mind history that tells us that that's uh, a pipe dream because things just seem to keep getting uh, worse instead of better. Uh, but there's this idea that Christmas sort of fits in with all of that. We've got all these wonderful uh, pictures, the baby in the, in the cradle with the parents and the animals, uh, and we can throw some angels in there. You know, pop culture is okay with angels as long as we don't get too serious about them. Uh, so we throw a few angels in and some songs, and, and it's all just a heartwarming, sentimental appeal to our better nature. There's a problem with that. The Bible says we don't have a better nature. So a more biblical vision of Christian is to say it's not the better nature that we need to appeal to, it's our sin nature that needs to be destroyed. And so the Bible says that Jesus came to destroy and defeat our sin nature. Uh, that it's not just the cradle, it's the cross, and it's the crown. We've got to put all those three things together to understand Christmas. That's a much better way to think about Christmas. It's far more biblical uh, than the folklore pop version of Christian. But I want to tell you today that even that doesn't go far enough. Even that doesn't go far enough. There's more, even more to Christmas than that uh, in all of this. If that's all there were to Christmas, then really we could all kind of just go off on our own and experience it individually and not worry about uh, the rest of the world. But Christmas is also, the birth of Jesus is also about this cosmic battle that's taking place between God and Satan. Because the birth of Jesus is front and center in this battle, right? just as it is here in Revelation uh, chapter 17. And so here, here's the next thing that we need to write down uh, on our bulletin. Jesus' birth is a part of this battle between God and Satan. Now, we could fill that sentence out a little bit, but I wanted to make the back of your bulletin neat. Um, it, we could say that Jesus' birth is a part of this uh, cosmic spiritual battle we talk about spiritual warfare this is this is where it's all spinning off of is this battle that's had this taking place between god and satan 
between Satan's angels and God's angels, Michael and his angels, and it all focuses in many ways on the birth of Jesus. It definitely focuses on Jesus. Remember what I said, that the birth, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus in the Bible really is all one event. So when we say the birth of Jesus, really theologically we're talking about the birth, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the second coming, and the eternal rule of Jesus. All one big package that Satan was trying to stop, and on the day that he was born, it began to unfold, and Satan knew that that was his end. And it was our victory. It, and it's unfolding to this day. That's where we stand in history, in the midst of this unfolding uh, spiritual battle between, uh, between God and, and Satan. And Jesus is the lightning rod, if you will, uh, uh, of, this, of this battle. Verse 14. To the two wings of... The great angel, the great eagle were given to the woman that, so that she might fly to her place in the wilderness and there be nourished for a time, times, and half a time away from the presence of the serpent. Notice the dragon is now called, he started out being called the devil today, then he was called the dragon, now he's called the serpent. He has, serpent. He has many names, many faces, but he's one individual. Now, this is, this is imagery that comes to us from the Exodus. And those of you who know your Bible remember the story of the Exodus, that God's people, Israel, were slaves in Egypt, and that God came and delivered them out of Egypt through the Red Sea into the wilderness. And in Exodus chapter 9, God spoke to the people and he said this to them. He said, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you to myself on eagles' wings. So there's a, there's a picture here of God as a mighty eagle uh, taking care of his, uh, of his chicks, if you will. They're riding on his wings uh, to victory. Now, the, the actual, uh, how this is going to play itself out in history, we don't know yet. We have the imagery. We saw how it played itself out uh, in, the, in the Exodus. It's obviously figurative language of some sort, and only when these events happen will we know for sure exactly how they play themselves out. We know how it played itself out in the Exodus. God came through Moses and, uh, and laid waste to Egypt. Pharaoh thought he was, he was the agent of the dragon back then. He was the agent of Satan. And he thought he was going to throw all the baby boys of Israel into the Nile River and destroy them and wipe them out. Instead, God threw his chariots into the Red Sea and swallowed them up and they were destroyed. Every time Satan tries to destroy God's people, there's a feast and a celebration that ends up happening. Have you thought about that? In Egypt, he tried to destroy their people and the Passover came out of it. In Babylon, he tried to destroy the people and Purim came out of it. When they were back in the land again, Antioch Epiphanes... Antioch IV Epiphanes tried to destroy the people of God between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Hanukkah came out of it. He tried to destroy Jesus in Bethlehem, and Christmas came out of it. Every time, every time the, the enemy tries to destroy the people of God and the work of God, God turns it into a victory. There's no reason, church, to believe that he's not going to do the same thing for us. He's going to take whatever looks like a defeat in our life and in history now, and it's going to turn out to be a feast and a celebration because he's going to win. This is a great time to live in history. We can look back and see that this has happened over and over again. Why should we doubt? Now, if we were living back in Abraham's time, maybe we could say, you know, God hasn't done much yet. These are big promises. What should we put up, base our promises on? We have no excuse. None. Because we can look at all of these acts, these scenes in history where God has done the same thing, and our faith, church, should be so strong. It says a time, times, and half a time. We're looking at the book of Revelation on Sunday nights. We'll get to this text eventually sometime next year, and we'll talk about this in more detail. I invite you to come and be a part of it on Sunday night. Uh, but for right now, we can just ask this question. Why any time at all? Why does the church have to be in the wilderness for any time at all? And we ask that question now. Why do I have to go through this at all? Why not the victory now? Let's just get to it. Let's get to it. If God's going to destroy Satan, then let's do it in the next 10 minutes so we don't have to worry about this anymore. But see, God's got His own timing. And He is, he is accomplishing things in this period of time. One thing that He's doing is He's revealing His power. 
You know, he could have just walked into Egypt and brought the, the Hebrew children out of there overnight. He could have said, this is over, I'm through, I, we're done, uh, Pharaoh is destroyed, his chariots are gone, all the wheels could have turned to dust, and the children of Israel could have walked out of there, but they had to hang around for ten miracles. For ten miracles. Because God said, I'm going to slow this thing down a little bit, and I'm going to show you my glory. I'm going to show you the weakness of the enemy, and I'm going to refine your faith as if you are gold in a fire. Church, here's what's happening right now. And if we start to see our lives this way, they'll make so much more sense. God is revealing himself as redeemer in our struggles, and he is refining our faith as gold in a fire. There's something going on in your struggle. It's not just accidental. Your struggle didn't come from Darwin. It came from God. And God is going to bring victory in your life. Look at the next couple of verses. Verses 15 and 16. The serpent spewed from his mouth water like a river to sweep the woman away. After the woman to sweep her away. The earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had swept out, had swept, uh, spewed out of his mouth. So we're back to dragon again. Did you notice we went devil, dragon, serpent, and now we're back to dragon again. It's, it's almost as if the revelation here of Satan is reminding us that he is a two-faced... Mm-mm-mm. He's a deceiver. You think you see him, and suddenly he's got a different mask on. One minute he's working through the institutions and the empires and the powerful, and the next minute he's he's right there in your house, scurrying around, looking for something to destroy. Like a lion, the Bible says, they're looking for someone to devour. That's what he does. He destroys. He lies. He tells us he's going to give us the victory, but he has no victory. He is a man of defeat. It's been defeat after defeat after defeat, an angel of defeat. He's a person of defeat. It's been defeat after defeat after defeat. And all of those who go after him will share in his defeat. Those of us who follow Jesus will share in his victory. These verses seem strange. A river coming out of a mouth, the earth swallowing the river. And there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of images that are invoked here that come from the Old Testament that later on we'll spend some time looking at, not this morning. But I want to show you something. There's, there's sort of an incongruity here that makes it very difficult to really interpret these verses. First of all, uh, it says that the river comes out of a mouth. That sounds like, uh, very clearly, a symbol for some kind of speech, some kind of deception. And that makes sense. Because a lot of deception comes out of the mouth of the dragon, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him, whatever mask he happens to have on today, a lot of deception comes out of his mouth. But if if that's what the figure is referring to, then why in the next verse does it say that the earth opens up its mouth and swallows the, the, the river? If it's deception, how in the world can the earth swallow deception? So what we have here in verse 14 uh, uh, is or, or 15 is we have a picture of something that looks symbolic and then in verse 16 something that looks more literal and we end up scratching our head this is one of the things that makes reading the book of revelation difficult but let me point something out to you that i'm going to be sharing on sunday night but we all need to, to know this in chapter 10 of the book of revelation the apostle john the one who's receiving this vision originally on the isle of patmos from an angel sent by Jesus, sent by God. He hears seven thunders. Number seven is important in the book of Revelation. It's a number of completion. He hears seven thunders, and those seven thunders say something intelligible to him. And he takes his pen out, and he gets ready to write down, because he's been writing down all that he's seen. Way back at the beginning, it says, write down uh, what the Lord says to the angel of the church in Ephesus and the angel of the church in Smyrna, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he's writing all of this down feverishly as he sees these visions on the Isle of Patmos. He hears the seven thunders speak to him, and he gets ready to write them down, and God tells him, no, don't write that down. Wow, that's a fascinating thing. God is withholding something from us. God is, has got some other revelation here the seven thunders, and maybe other things as well, that he has said, it's not time for you to hear those yet. So just keep them hidden. 
Daniel was told the same kind of thing. He said, I don't understand half of what I've seen. And God said, don't worry about it when the time comes. The people who need to understand it will understand it. When we look at the book of Revelation, we need to recognize that there are some things that will not make sense, no matter how hard we try, until they actually happen. But that's the way prophecy is. Then we can look back and say, you know, I always wondered about that. But by golly, look at that. God did exactly what he said. We just didn't understand it. So what are these wings and the, the desert and the, and the river and the earth swallowing, uh, opening its mouth up? Not sure uh, exactly. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas, but it's an easy image to remember. And if we're alive when it, when it happens, we'll all go, hot dog, look at that. That's what that was talking about. God's word is sure. God's word is worth building our life on. Look at the last verse this morning, verse 17. The dragon was enraged at the woman. And he went out to make war against the rest of her offspring. Those keeping the commands of God and those having the testimony of Jesus. Now, some of your translations put verse 18 uh, at the beginning end of this chapter, but it's kind of a transition verse. It really kind of belongs at the, in the next. So we'll stop here this morning in verse 17. So Satan realizes he's lost again. He can't destroy... God's people, God's people as a whole, his chosen people will not be destroyed. God has promised that they will, that they will survive to the very end. And so what he does is he turns his attention to, uh, it looks like it's saying here is that he turns his attention to individual, individuals, to try to destroy as many individuals, as many families. If he can't destroy the people of Israel, he'll destroy as many Israelites as he can. If he can't destroy the church, He'll destroy as many Christians as he can. There's a, one of the debates about how to understand the book of Revelation is what is the relationship between God's people in the Old Testament, Israel, and God's chosen people in the New Testament, the church? How do those two things relate? How do those two groups of people relate? And this verse 17 raises, raises that question. But verse 17 tells us something important about the answer. There is only one salvation. It doesn't matter who we, who we start out belonging to, whether we're Israelites, Gentiles, whether they live on this side of the earth, the other side of the earth, whether we were born 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years from now, whether we're uh, poor or rich, black, white, none of it matters except that we have obedience to the commands of God and we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the real dividing line uh, in God's heart. That's the real dividing line. You see, in Romans, Paul said uh, that there, there's just one gospel. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. There's not a different salvation for different groups. There's only one salvation. And here it's those who obey the commands of God and have the testimony of Jesus Here's one of Satan's lies in our culture. You're going to be shocked when I first say it, so stick with me, okay? Once saved, always saved. Now, now some of you are ready to fire me. I understand that. But let's, let's look at this from the Bible's perspective. First of all, we need to recognize that those words don't occur in the Bible. Those are words that, are, that man has come up with to describe a theological truth. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't do that because sometimes man's words do reflect the truth of Scripture well, but we should never forget that the words of Scripture are the ones that we really need to hang our hat on. Now, I know the, the next question is, well, Richard, are you saying that you can lose your salvation? So now let me put your mind at ease a little bit. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that you can lose your salvation. I believe the Bible... Uh, it teaches very plainly that, uh, that a person who has been saved will stay saved. But the Bible never says, once saved, always saved. The Bible expresses it in a different way. The Bible says this, and you can look it up later in 1 Corinthians 15 and then cross-reference it if you're, if you're wanting to make sure that I'm right. The Bible says that if we continue to stand, then we'll be saved. See, the Bible says that some people look like they're saved. They start out standing, and we all look and we say it looks like a believer, and they fall somewhere along the way. Some people have mis misinterpreted that to mean that they had salvation and they lost it, but the Bible says they never had it in the first place. It was just a facade. 
because they believed, they had the, the wrong beliefs, the wrong ideas about salvation. One thing is clear, one of the problems with the, with the, man-made, uh, the man-made phrase, once saved, always saved, is there's a lot of people in Camden this morning sleeping late or doing something else. And they had an experience when they were at camp years ago, and they cried, and they uh, prayed with a, pr- a preacher, and they got baptized, and they got their name put on a roll of one of these churches around here. And then they went out and grew up, and they're living their life for themselves, don't have any interest at all in Jesus, in the Bible, in worshiping, in prayer, any of those things. But they think they're on their way to heaven, and the, the guy that wears all the different masks has fooled them, and they're on their way to hell. This battle is real. This is not just some ancient religious mythology. The battle is raging all around us right now. Lives are being destroyed this very moment. And they're also being established and built up this very moment. And Jesus says, let me pull this curtain open and let you see a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes here. And this description right here at the end in verse 17 is so important. Those who obey the commands of God. If we think that we can say a prayer and not obey God and we're on our way to heaven, we've been fooled by the dragon. We've been swept away by the the water that spews out of his mouth. Because those who have the testimony of Jesus have the obedience to God's commands. Now, let me quickly add, we all trip and fall. I'm not saying that, I'm not preaching a perfectionism this morning. The Bible also says that uh, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's not talking about unbelievers there. He's talking about believers. The Israelite knew that they had to keep coming to the altar and offering those sacrifices over and over again. Praise God, we don't have to do that. Our sacrifice has been offered once for all. But we do still have to come and get on our knees and say, God, I sin, please forgive me. And he does. But I can't use that as an excuse to go run with the dragon and think I'm going to end up with the lamb. Because if you run with the dragon, you go with the dragon. If you want to end up with the lamb, you better run with the lamb. That's That's how this thing works. So here's the last sentence this morning. Jesus' victory, it's all one thing. His birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation, his intercession, his parousia, his millennial kingdom, his ultimate triumph, his day of judgment, his eternal state. It's all one thing. I'll call it victory here. Jesus' victory is available to all who obey and testify. Who obey and testify. And testify, obey God's commands and testify to faith in the crucified one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey and testify. Trust and obey, we sing the old hymn. Turns out those are pretty good words. Trust and obey. By the way, if you want to express the idea of once saved, always saved, more accurately, more theologically accurate, there is a way to do that. It's called the... Um, it's called the... Um, Well, I forgot it. What's that? It is a senior moment. Thank you for reminding me, Cindy. I appreciate that. I've been thinking about coloring my hair a little bit. It's not, uh, I've got the wrong word in my head and it's not going to get out of the way, but it's something like the persistence of the saints. Thank you. I know you'd know it. The perseverance of the saints. That's, those are better words. That's a better expression of what Jesus said. You want Jesus' words? Here's Jesus' words. Nobody can snatch them from my hand. So if you want the Bible's words, there's the Bible's words. Just throw man's words away. Use, use Jesus' words. Nobody can snatch them from my hand. That's a good thing to know. Uh, that's a good thing to know. Did you notice how... Uh, uh, President Trump said that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. We talked about this last uh, uh, Sunday night. It's amazing how that part of the world continues to be uh, in the headlines. And, and this is something that prophecy, uh, that prophecy predicted long ago, long before any of us ever picked up a Bible. Uh, God said, this is where it's all going to happen. Right here, this land that I gave my people Israel and this place called Jerusalem where I chose to put my name and where there was a temple uh, that, that's the center of history. And, and all, the, uh, all the skepticism, 
uh, and all the Darwinism cannot wipe that away. History is following exactly where God said that it would go. A lot of people thought that it was just some kind of spiritual thing. You know, after 2,000 years, one ethnic group being spread around the world to the four corners of the world, most, probably any other ethnic group would intermarry and be wiped out, but not the, Is- Israel- not the Israelites, not the Hebrews, not the Jews, not God's chosen people, because the hand of God is on those people. Uh, that's the woman that brought the child to birth, and he's made certain promises, and those promises are for, there to, uh, for us to look at and see God has fulfilled those promises that looked impossible and so even if I think his promises now look impossible he's still going to fulfill them before 1948 people said that the fulfillment of the promise that God would bring his people back from the four corners of the world to every place that he had scattered them he would bring them back and put them back and make them a nation Israel people said it's impossible it won't happen that's what they said most of us are too young to know this but it wasn't that long ago in the early 20th century. And then in May of 1948, bang, the people were in Israel again. I want to tell you something. That changed a lot of people's minds about biblical prophecy. One of the reasons that people are so fascinated with the book of Revelation and the second coming of Jesus and biblical prophecy today, in case you don't realize this, is because of what happened in May of 1948 in history that's documented. It's not some kind of religious myth or folklore. It is something that happened in space and time. And it's something that was predicted by God. And we should be able to say, hallelujah, God fulfills his promises. He fulfilled that one. He's going to fulfill them all. I want to strengthen your faith. I want you to be strong men and women of faith. Because we live in a world where there's a, there's, a, there's a river that's trying to sweep us away. You know that. But we can stand strong. Bow your heads with me, would you please? I wonder if there's somebody in here this morning who has been re- wrestling with God. You've never made a public profession of faith. You know you need to be saved. Uh, We're going to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. We'll have uh, what we call as a time of invitation. Um, And you can come forward and speak to me or one of the people who are up here with me and pray with them. Let me just say this. The Bible says that to be saved, we have to first of all realize that we need to be saved. The world's telling us now we don't need to be saved. We're good. We're okay. We just need to appeal to our better nature. We don't have a better nature. We need to be saved. We need to be changed. We need to be transformed. That's what the Bible says. But the Holy Spirit has to come into your life and convince you of that. And maybe you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit has been working on you and suddenly you have realized recently, you know what? I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven. I need to be saved. Here's how the Bible says that you are saved. First of all, Jesus died for you and the rest of his people uh, so that he's a sacrifice so that we can be forgiven. There's nothing we can do to be, be forgiven. There's nothing we can do to make up for our sin somebody else has to do that Jesus did that he died on the cross for our sin now what you have to do and what I have to do is uh is is very clear in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 it says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead we will be saved listen to that again this is the Bible this is not man's words these are God's words if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved right that's what i'm asking you to do if you haven't done that i'm asking you to confess with your mouth that jesus is lord do you believe already that god raised him from the dead you know he died for your sins you're ready to confess i'm giving you the opportunity this morning right now to confess with your mouth that jesus is lord uh, and say i'm saved i know i'm saved i'm on the winning side no matter what happens to me i know where i'm going If that's you, I'm going to ask you to come forward and let me pray with you uh, during this invitation. The altar's open if you need to join the church, if you need to get baptized, or there's another decision, perhaps uh, rededicate your life, or just come and get on your knees and pray. This is the time to do that. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Lord, let your words dwell richly, God, in our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. You come, don't wait.